Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, Lord, thank you for another time together. Amen. Another time to get into your economy. Amen. This is a uh, Christian students at UC Tyler. It's our spring semester 2021. Our general topic this semester has been God's economy. And we are on uh, lesson number 11. Uh, we're going to talk about God's judicial redemption. Amen. Uh, so before we jump into that, hopefully you all can see my, my screen here. I'm going gonna, gonna to draw our wire diagram. That's what we call it. Uh, wire diagram. Just to get us caught up to speed again. And a reminder where, what we're getting into when we're talking about God's economy. Let me see if it's recording okay here. We can see that. Okay, so first we talk about God, right? Everything starts and ends with God. Amen. Amen. All right, so God in eternity past is all alone. He holds a council in his Godhead, and uh, the, he, he makes a decision that uh, I don't want to be alone, right? Yeah. I'm oversimplifying it, right? But it's not good. Uh, being lonely or alone is not a good thing, right? And we actually see this after God creates Adam, and Adam is alone, and God says it's not good for man to be alone. So being alone is not good. Uh, so, so in eternity past, he, he determined that he would uh, create man in his image, right? Uh, so this is a picture of us. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, but we have uh, a body, right? I'm doing this. Uh, uh, we have our, our soul. So our body contacts the physical realm. Our soul contacts the psychological realm, right? Our mind, emotion, will. And we have a spirit. Amen. We have a human spirit. And our spirit is to contact spiritual things, right? And that's God himself, right? Uh, so God made man as a vessel, right? As a container in his image. So that means if we're in his image and we're a vessel, what should we be filled with? We should be filled with God, right? Uh, this is what's, what uh, will accomplish his heart's desire to not be alone. He'll be joined to man. Man will be joined to him. You have many sons. You have many brothers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so this makes God happy. Uh, but uh, because God has an enemy, Satan came in, right, and uh, injected the satanic nature into man. And so uh, man fell, right? And uh, so man's spirit was deadened. It was not functioning. Uh, it's still there, but it lost its function. It's dead in. Uh, our soul has become the self, all right? And our body has become the flesh. So this state is a sinful man, fallen man. God cannot join himself to this man in this condition. God's holiness, God's glory, and God's righteousness prevent him. Even though he wants to be one of man, he cannot be one of man in this condition. All right, so we know that Hallelujah and his economy, right, he went through a process. And first he became a man, right? We saw that. It was wonderful. The infinite God that became a finite man, the divine life was united to the human life, the divine nature is mingled with the human nature. Right? God and man have been incorporated. Uh, and then uh, he had a perfect human living, right? He did not take any shortcuts. He's a genuine man, 100%, right? Uh, and in his humanity, he was doing a couple of things. Uh, one was he was living out God, right? All the time. The divine attributes were being expressed through his human virtues all the time, regardless of what he was doing, right? Always expressing God in his humanity. God needs humanity. To express himself, right? And uh, then, actually, in his human living, he lived a perfect human living. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit uh, to accomplish God's judicial redemption on the cross. All right, so he was crucified. Crucifixion was all inclusive. He terminated all the negative things in the universe and positively he released his divine life. Right? He was buried and then he resurrected. Sorry, I'm running around a room here. Resurrected. As a life-giving spirit. And so now, at the cross, negatively, he's taking care of the problem of sin. 
positively, he's the life giving spirit. I can give life now. And so in his ascension, right, he's made Lord of Lords, King of Kings, high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He is enthroned, right? And uh, in his heavenly ministry, uh, he's doing something. Right? He is dispensing. Amen. He's very active. Right? God is very active and he's dispensing himself Amen. firstly into us, right? Into our spirit. I mean, uh, and so he regenerates our spirit. God comes in there. So now he's in our spirit. Amen. And but he doesn't want to just remain in our spirit. Right. He wants to fill us completely. So he's gonna transform our soul, right? And he's gonna glorify our body. Okay, so that we're gonna talk about later. Okay, but this is a whole process, yeah. right? That God has went, gone through. Uh, and so there, uh, he went through this whole process to dispense himself to for his complete salvation. Mm -hmm. He wants to save us completely. So what does that mean, completely? Okay, so here we're going to see God's judicial redemption. We're going to talk about that first. You know, what did the Lord do objectively on the cross that we need, right? In order to for him to... Firstly, come into our spirit, but also to spread. Okay, so we're going to talk about God's judicial redemption. All right, so here's the first point. Let's read Roman number one. Uh, and how about this? Uh, maybe Paul, Paul and Emmanuel. I don't know if you can see the screen. If you can read Roman number one. God complete salvation. Salvation is of two aspects. Just the Judicial redemption and organic salvation. Amen. So God's complete salvation has two aspects. Okay, it has a judicial redemption and organic salvation. Okay, we need both. All right, we need that's the complete salvation. Uh, judicial redemption, we'll see in our fellowship. Judicial redemption is for organic salvation. And I cannot have organic salvation without judicial redemption, Amen. right? Uh, so this is God's complete salvation, but we need to talk about judicial redemption first. Okay, so we're actually going to, and there's, there's some two verses here, Romans 5, 17 and 21, um, and maybe uh, maybe Roger, you can read these uh, two verses, and in these two verses, we'll actually see both aspects in these verses. Okay, so how about Paul, uh, Roger, sorry. Yeah, man. Uh, so Romans 5, uh, 17 and 21. Uh, for if by the offense of the one uh, death uh, reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of the righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so I can't see uh, this one. I can't see it. Can you can't see it? Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, do it. I can, yeah. I'll go ahead and read it then. Okay, uh, verse 21 says, uh, in order that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, so in these verses we see, right, man's fallen condition, right, the offense of the one, death reigned through the one. So Adam uh, committed the offense, right, Adam and Eve there, and through them sin entered into all men, right, Whatever you inherit, whatever your parents had. So Adam and Eve, the you, all their descendants have the same nature as they do, which is the fallen nature, the satanic nature is gotten injected into man. Okay, uh, and so the result of sin is death. So death is passed on through all men, right? Mm -hmm. Through the one. Okay, so that's our terrible situation. But hallelujah, amen. Yeah. Right, uh, much more. Right, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Okay, so we need uh, Christ as our righteousness, as our redemption. We'll see here. Uh, but the point of it is when you receive, it's for life, right? We'll reign in life. So actually we see here we receive the abundance of grace. It's actually organic. And the gift of righteousness that's related to judicial redemption. Uh, we will reign in life. The purpose of uh, of, uh, of judicial redemption uh, is life, 
right? This is the organic cell base for life. Okay, we remain alive. And then in verse 21, uh, grace, again, here we see this is actually related to organic salvation, might reign through righteousness. It needs righteousness as the foundation unto eternal life, right? The goal here is not simply redemption. The goal is that this life would be manifested, would grow, develop, be expressed, right? Um, and so here we see these kind of two aspects, just in, you know, in, in two verses, very in a simple way, but uh, we just to highlight a couple of things. Okay, so first thing we, we want to talk about is what is redemption? Okay, so uh, Roman numeral two uh, here says uh, redemption is to purchase back something which was yours, but which has become lost. Okay, so God created man for his purpose, right, for his intention, and uh, and then Satan came in and corrupted man. He usurped man. He uh, he's actually done this actually illegally, right? God is man. Man is meant for God, mm -hmm. so he's come in and injected himself. So now man has been lost from God. So in in that situation, God, in order to get back what was lost, he has to redeem. So redeem means to purchase back. I lost something, and I need to purchase it back. And I, I, I used this example before. Maybe it's a poor example. I don't know. But, you know, if you have a vehicle, a, a car, you know, automobile, and you maybe you park it in a place you're not supposed to park, and then the tow truck comes, and they tow your car away, and they put it in the pound, right? And so uh, now you need to go get your car back. Right, it, you you did something wrong, which you were not supposed to do. You you parked illegally, or you're not supposed to, and but that car still belongs to you, uh, and so you it's for your purpose, right? For your intention. So you need to go to the pound, and you need to redeem your car. You need to purchase it back. Mm -hmm. You have to pay a price to get it back because mm -hmm. you've lost it, right? Uh, and so, anyways, uh, so like I said, maybe a poor example, but. That's our situation before God, right? We're, we're, man is meant for God's purpose, but a price needs to be paid to, to purchase us back to God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here in, in Revelation 5, 9, uh, how, about, uh, how about the ones who are in the room with me? Maybe you can read this uh, verse. And they sing a new song, saying, You are worthy, for you were slain and have purchased for God by your blood. Men out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Amen. Amen. Right. Oh, so the Lord, praise the Lord, he's worthy. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, he paid the price. The price, the wages of sin is death. Right? That's the price that needs to be paid. Uh, because the Lord, that's that's sin is death. Yeah, you know, in the day that they eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. That's the result of taking in the satanic nature. It's death. He is, he is the might of death. He is he's, uh, intending on destroying man. That's his intention, Satan. Right? So what? So the, the payment that is needed is death. Uh, and so the Lord paid the price. That's the price he paid to, to get us back. It's the ultimate price. There's no other high, that's the highest price you can pay is your own life. Right, and so uh, that's what the Lord has done. Right, He has purchased us with His blood. Praise the Lord! Amen. So He's worthy. Amen. He's worthy of all our praise. Right, our appreciation. Uh, and He was purchased by God, uh, for God, uh, men out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Hallelujah! Because every person on this earth is a vessel in God's image, meant to be filled and contained, express Him. All right, every person. Uh, so here in Galatians 3.13, um, maybe, uh, let's see here, how about Paul? You want to read this verse? Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us out of the curses of the law, mm -hmm. having become a curser on our behalf, because it is written, cursed is everyone hugging on a, a tree? Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. Amen. 
So, so the question here, uh, I, I guess I wish I had, I had asked before I, we read the verse. <laughs> well, what did the Lord redeem us from? All right? Uh, I don't know what your answer might have been. But here uh, we see in Galatians 3.13 the answer, uh, and also Galatians 4.5 here. Okay, uh, maybe Paul, you can finish Galatians 4.5 too. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, that he might redeem those under law, that we might receive the sonship. Amen. So he redeemed us out of the curse of the law. So he did not redeem us from our sins. You know, you might, uh, that's the answer I would have given it once, once upon a time. Oh, well, he redeemed us from my sin. Uh, no, he redeemed us actually from out of the curse of the law. Because sin came in, uh, God in his righteousness, uh, he brought in the law, okay? In order, actually in Galatians 3, chapter 3 here, a few verses later, uh, the law is a child conductor. It preserves humanity uh, from falling further and further away. Um, but the law condemns us because there, we cannot come up to the standard of the law. Uh, the law is according to God himself. So I cannot come up to God's standard. Only God can come up to God's standard. Yeah. So the law actually exposes that we are short right. why are we short it's because we're sinners mm -hmm. and so the law is a curse to us because i cannot attain to this law it's not possible mm -hmm. so uh in galatians 4 4 which is not here on your outline uh, i wish i included this verse but you can read it for yourself in your bible but i'll read it to you um it says here uh that uh, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. Mm -hmm. So in Christ and in his incarnation, because he became a man, he put on humanity. Guess what? All of mankind is under the law. So who is also under the law? The Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus was under the law as a man. Right? Uh, and so uh, being under the law... He was the only one as a man who could fulfill the law. His whole life, no flaw, no sin, right? Didn't fall into temptation, right? He lived according to God. Uh, you know, he, he lived a perfect human life. So because he did that, he was able to redeem those under law, Amen. right? He fulfilled the law. Yeah. Uh, I think we maybe have these verses later on. But so the Lord, uh, he was in his living, his intention was I, the law needs to be met. There is a price that needs to be paid. I, you know, so I'm going to live the perfect human life, meet the standard of the law, take care of God's righteousness, mm -hmm. right? That I might redeem those under law for what purpose? That we might receive the sonship. That's Amen. verse five, Galatians 4 5. Oh, for life. Oh, many sons. Right? Oh, this is the purpose of his judicial redemption. Okay, so redemption means that we were bought back. We were bought back from under the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Right back, brought back to God that we might receive the sonship for right? his life. Okay, so now we see what redemption means. Uh, we're going to see uh, in Roman number three. God's judicial redemption is the foundational aspect of God's complete salvation. So it's not the purpose. It's the foundation. The purpose is the organic salvation. Okay, but you need a foundation. All right, so why do we need this foundation? Firstly, it is according to the righteousness of God. Judicial means legal, right? It's a legal process. There is a legal need that needs to be met. And it's God's righteousness. Okay, so Psalm 89, 14. Uh, how about uh, Annette? Why don't you read that one? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Amen. Amen. So righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Mm -hmm. As much as God loves man and wants to be one with man, he is held to his own righteousness. He cannot 
uh, be unrighteous. If he if he does, he gives ground to Satan. Actually, the whole universe collapses, really. Uh, but he gives ground to Satan. See, you're unrighteous, God. God is righteous. It's what he is, actually, mm -hmm. the divine attribute. He cannot be unrighteous. It's not possible, yeah. really, yeah. actually. But it's the foundation of his throne. But the point being is, as much as I love man, as much as I want to be one with man, and if man fell, I can't simply ignore my righteousness. And you know what? I'm just going to make myself one with him anyways. Mm -hmm. Right? No. In the day you eat of it, that tree of knowledge of good and evil, that day you shall surely die. The righteous requirement must be met. Okay, so it's a, God's judicial redemption is according to the righteousness. And then one Romans 1.17, uh, how about uh, Jonathan, you want to read that? For the righteousness of God is revealed from the power of faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall have life and live by faith. Amen. Amen. So here we see right, God's righteousness is revealed, actually in the gospel. Um, and what, what is the purpose of being righteous? Oh, the righteous shall have life and live by faith, right? Oh, that's the purpose of experiencing judicial redemption, is that you are made righteous to take care of God's righteous requirement, right? That you shall have life and live by faith, right? Okay, and so in Romans 3, 24 and 25, um, uh, again, seeing that God's judicial redemption is according to the righteousness of God, it says here, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, right? That's the foundation, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation place through faith in his blood for the demonstrating of his righteousness. So God's righteousness is taken care of by God, uh, by the Lord's judicial redemption, right? Okay, so we just we're just seeing that it's according to God's righteousness, which is actually a very secure thing, right. because it's not according to how God feels, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it is a legal matter with God. God righteously has to forgive me, for example. He has to, even if I did something terrible, right? Yeah. Uh, if I repent and confess, uh, He righteously has to forgive me. It doesn't matter how angry he is about it. He's like, well, I have to forgive you according to my righteousness. Amen. That is very secure, yeah. right? It's the foundation of God's throne, Amen. right? Amen. Okay, so, uh, and then continuing, God's judicial redemption is a foundational aspect of God's complete salvation. Uh, point B, it is through God's fulfilling of all the requirements of his righteous law on sinners by Christ's redemptive death on the cross, okay? So we're going to read some several verses here. How about, um, okay, Paul, how about Paul and Emmanuel? Amen. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of offness according to the riches of his grace. Praise Amen. the Lord. Right, oh, so in the Lord we have redemption, through his blood, right? Uh, according to the riches of his grace, forgiveness of offenses, okay? Uh, Galatians 3.13, Christ, we saw this verse a little earlier. We focused on the first part. Christ has redeemed us out of the curse of the law. But the second part, having become a curse on our behalf, right? So it was through his fulfilling all the righteous requirements, he became a curse on our behalf. He, he took on the curse, nailed it to the cross, amen. amen. Terminated it. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful, all-inclusive death. Amen. Right, because he after death there's resurrection, Amen. right, and the, the, all, the curse and everything is left in the grave, Amen. left in the tomb. Amen. Amen. Uh, and then in uh, Matthew uh, five seventeen and Romans ten four, remember the law is there hanging over our heads; it's condemning us. You know, um, and actually, if you have not believed and received the Lord Jesus Christ, the law is still hanging over your head. It's, it's still there, okay? So how do we know that it's still there? Okay, uh, well, Matthew 5, 17, if you read this. Um, uh, how about uh, Charlene, right? read five, Matthew 5, 17. And do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen. Amen. So the Lord did not come to abolish the law, 
completely destroy it and it's no longer there. I have come to fulfill it. It needs to be fulfilled. Right? So I'm here to fulfill the requirements, but the law is actually still there. It's still present. It's not been abolished. Okay, so wait a minute. How does that apply to us then? What's our, our relationship to the law if it's still there? Okay, Romans 10, 4. How about Annette? You read that one. For Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen. So Christ is the end of the law. Okay, hallelujah. <laughs> he's the end of the law. Uh, i sorry, I lost my place here. On the, uh, unto righteousness, right? He's taking care of it righteously. To who? To everyone who believes. Okay, hallelujah. He fulfilled the law. And guess what? Because I believe it's the end. I've been redeemed out from it. That's what it means to be redeemed. I'm no longer under the law. It's to me, it's been ended. I'm dead to the law, and the law is dead to me, actually, right? I, I I've been removed, I've been placed back into God's original intention. The law was not God's original intention. Right? Sonship is God's original intention. Right? And I've been brought back uh, to the right position before God. But the law is still there, right? For everyone who does not believe, I'll just change this verse a little bit, right? If you don't believe, you're still condemned by the law. Whether you're, you believe in God or not, period. You're under God's condemnation, right? Okay, so hallelujah, Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. That's us, amen. amen. Uh, okay, and then continuing with the Lord fulfilling all the requirements uh, through his death on the cross, redemptive death. Hebrews 9, 12 says, uh, and not through the blood of goats and calves. This was the Old Testament way of temporarily satisfying God's requirement. But through his own blood, right, Jesus, right, entered once for all into the Holy of Holies, once for all, Amen. obtaining an eternal redemption. So in the Old Testament, they had to keep bringing in the blood of goats and calves into the Holy of Holies year after year to sprinkle it because that blood could not take away sin. It could, uh, at the time, just cover up the sin. But underneath all that blood, all God still, there's a sin is still there, right? Okay, well, but I need a blood that doesn't just cover. I need a blood that removes my sin, Amen. takes it away, Amen. right? Amen. And so Christ entered in once for all into the Holy of Holies. One, through his death, once for all, he went in there, I've shed my blood, and this, because it, I'm God, not just man, I can obtain an eternal redemption, Amen. right? Oh, it's eternal redemption. It's secure. It's eternal. It, it applies to anyone who receives it, right? It's not limited to one person, right? Because he's God, right? It's limited. It's not limited. Amen. Amen. It's our eternal redemption. Okay, God. All right, let's go. Let's continue. Let's let's roll here. Amen. Okay, number number four. Amen. Uh, all right, so we're going to run through some of this stuff. Uh, amen. Not, not, uh, not meaning to diminish anything or anything like that. All of these things are precious, but for the sake of time. Okay, God's judicial redemption results objectively in a few things. It re results in God's forgiveness of the believer's sins. Amen. All right, uh, so let's read these verses here. How about, uh, how about we here in the room? How about Annetta, Charlene, and then Jonathan? Okay. Matthew 26, 3. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1.14, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Acts 10.43, for this one, all the prophets testify that through his name, everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness. Amen. So here we see, right? Oh, hallelujah. Through the, the redemption, we receive forgiveness of sins. No matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how many, no matter how how often, right? Oh, we we receive forgiveness of sins, right? Uh, through the Lord's redemption. So that's that's a, a first point here, uh, and then also it results in a God's washing away the believer's sins. So it's, it's one thing to forgive, but it's another thing to wash it away. Okay, so uh, I'll read. Uh, couple of these verses, maybe. Acts 22, 16. And now, why do you delay? Rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins. 
right? Oh, our, our sins can be washed away, calling on his name. This is to, uh, this is Paul giving his testimony when he, he got uh, saved and Ananias visited him. Okay, Hebrews 1.3. This is Jesus who, having made purification of sins, okay, they've been washed away, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then Psalm 103, 12, hallelujah, as far as the east is from the west, uh, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So how far is the east from the west? It just, it's infinite, yeah. Oh, that's how far. God has removed our transgressions from us. Amen. So, you know, in, in the Old Testament, the, the, their sins were covered up by the, the blood of goats and sheep, etc. But they were still there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, oh, but the blood of Christ, not only does it forgive us, he washes us. And actually, I wish I included the verse, you know, that he washes us and makes us white as snow. Right? It's Isaiah, right? Uh, so there's no stain. When we sin, it's like the, the stain got on you, right? And then, you know, you ask for forgiveness, and the Lord forgives you. But if the stain is still there, you know, that's still a problem, yeah. right? And so, no, it, wow, he washes the stain away, and actually God forgets. He doesn't, he doesn't remember. Okay, uh, the next point. Uh, it results in justification. Okay, so what is justification? Uh, how about uh, everybody in this room, how do you read point C? Justification. God approving us according to his standard of righteousness. Amen. So justification is God's approving. Approving, again, according to his standard of righteousness. He has to maintain it. Uh, so here we see some verses in Romans 3, uh, 24, being justified freely. How? By his grace through the redemption. All right. So redemption is the basis for being justified. Romans 5.18, uh, it was through, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, it was through one righteous act unto justification of life to all men. So the righteous act was Christ's redemption, right? Uh, and then uh, Romans 8.33. Uh, who shall, Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God, chosen ones? It is God who justified. Amen. It's God who justifies. Who brings the charge against Amen. us? Oh, if I've received the Lord's redemption, if I've applied his blood, if I've received forgiveness and washing away, I am justified according to God's standard of righteousness. Amen. So if anyone comes to me, including Satan, right, yeah. comes to me and just starts attacking me inwardly and accusing me and stuff like that, who shall bring a charge Amen. against me? I'm God's chosen one. Mm -hmm. God justifies me. I've applied the blood, right? Uh, I'm uh, applying God's righteous judicial redemption. Okay, um, and then uh, D, point, point D, uh, propitiation. Okay, so what does propitiation mean? Maybe you've seen this in the Bible. Um, propitiation means to appease the situation between us and God and to make us one with God by satisfying his righteous demand. Okay, so because we're sinners, well, here, let's read the verses here. Uh, Luke 18, 13. Uh, how about, Annette, I want you to read both of those verses. Luke 18, 13, 1 John 2, 2. But the tax collector, standing at a distance, could not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying to God, be propitiated to me, the sinner. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Amen. Amen. Right, so here we see this is a parable that the Lord was telling. Uh, you know, this righteous man and the tax collector. The tax collector, he's a sinner. And uh, I won't get into the whole story there. You can read it in Luke 18. Uh, but the righteous man basically is like, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm not like this guy, this sinner here. And the, the tax collector, he just won't even look up. He just, he's just shameful. He's just ashamed, like, and he realizes I'm a sinner, and I there's some there's a problem between me and God, there's a situation, and it's my sin, and being a sinner, so all I can do is say, God, be propitiated to me. I know I need propitiation. I know I know that I need to appease the situation between you and me, and I can't, right, uh, right. I need a propitiation, 
sacrifice. And that's 1 John 2, 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sin. Uh, so the Lord um, is just wonderful. He is, uh, he is the one who offers the propitiation to God on our behalf. He is the propitiatory sacrifice itself, Amen. and he is the place where the propitiation is offered, Amen. right? Where we meet with God. He's all these things to us, right? But basically, it's to appease the situation uh, between us and uh, God, right? Uh, and so let's uh, continue here. Uh, so propitiation means to appease the situation. Okay, but now there's something further. Uh, um, let's see here. We need to reconcile, be reconciled. So the Lord's redemption also results in God's re reconciling the believers who were his enemies back to himself. Amen. Okay. Uh, so how about Jonathan? Can you read these verses in Romans 5? Mm -hmm. Romans 5, verse 5 and 1. Therefore, having been justified out of faith, we have peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Romans 5, 10 and 11. For we, being enemies, were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more we will be saved in his life, Amen. having been reconciled. Amen. Amen. And not only so, but also boasting in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Amen. Amen. All right, so here we see we were enemies to God, so we needed to be reconciled. And then also Colossians 1, 22 to 20, 21 through 22, it says, And you, though once alienated and enemies, in your mind, because of your evil works, he now is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. All right. Amen. To present you holy without blemish, without reproach before him. Amen. So his death reconciled us to. So, you know, there's a, maybe uh, I'll have another uh, uh, little poor example here or, or not, but uh, to kind of get an idea of, you know, justification, propitiation, reconciliation, you know, maybe. Um, Maybe you, you do something, uh, let's say I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Perhaps I, uh, I offend somebody or I commit an offense against somebody, uh, let's say by stealing somebody's, I don't know, cell phone. Uh, so I steal the cell phone. So there's an offense that's been committed, right? Uh, I am condemned, right? Uh, and uh, so there's a negative situation, uh, but I uh, come to my senses, maybe I may be in trouble. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in order to appease the situation, right, to be, have a propitiate, be, be propitiated to this person, I either restore the phone or maybe I pay the value of the phone, right? So, okay, the phone was worth $800 and I pay. And so the, uh, the legal matter has been taken care of, right? Um, I've, I paid what it was worth, and uh, so actually I've been propitiated because of the the demand from the other was you owe me a phone or the money for the phone, so the demand was met. So there's an I was appeased to them, and actually I'm I'm also uh, you can say I'm justified, right? That now the problem has been resolved, been taken care of. Uh, you know, maybe it wasn't a legal matter, maybe it was a civil matter, but anyways. Uh, uh, but now, let's say it was my roommate that I did this to, okay, and I got to live with this guy. Um, so I've been propitiated to him, taking care of the, the, the demand, but um, actually we're, we're basically enemies, right? He, he doesn't like me, and maybe I don't like him. There's a problem uh, between us that I need to be reconciled back to him, right? There, there, even though there's no monetary problem between us or anything like that, legal problem between us, there's an uncomfortable situation between yeah. us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You may even say, I forgive you, you know, for doing that. But still, like, I need to be reconciled to him. Mm -hmm. And the reason I need to be reconciled, at least to God, right, is we are enemies, actually. We're enemies to God. We are one with Satan. Satan is God's enemy. Right, and in, in Colossians 1 21, and say we're enemies in our minds, yeah. our mind is just contrary to God, okay. right? Uh, so I need to be reconciled to God. So, on one hand, actually, we have been reconciled to God through the death of His Son, but
But on the other hand, we're still being reconciled. There's much of me that is my thoughts that's still an enemy of God. Right. Okay, so uh, continuing here, sanctifying the believers in their position unto himself as his holy people. Amen. Okay, so Hebrews 13, 12. Uh, Therefore also Jesus, that he might sanctify the people in his own, through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Colossians 1, 13. Who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Amen. Amen. So our position has changed by receiving Amen. God's redemption. So not just I received forgiveness of sins and washing and I've been reconciled to God, but my position now has changed. Okay, so we call this positional sanctification. I was previously in the authority of darkness. So I was in Satan's kingdom, right? Uh, and now, uh, by accepting Christ in his judicial redemption, my position has changed into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Amen. Okay, so we've been sanctified in our position unto God himself. Amen. So that's the beginning. That's where we'll start to have the organic yeah. salvation. Now that our position has changed, God can grow in us, right, with his life and transform our soul and eventually glorify our body. Okay, so uh, this is what happens, right? Uh, our position has changed. And then Roman numeral five here uh, to, to kind of summarize what we we're fellowshipping, God's judicial redemption is the procedure to qualify and position the believers to participate in God's organic salvation. And God's organic salvation is the purpose of the complete salvation of God, right? It's not simply to forgive my sins, right? It's not simply to be justified to God. It's now my position has changed so that God can add himself into my, not just my spirit, but my soul, my body. Okay. And so um, we have uh, a section here. Um, uh, it's the parable of the prodigal son. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think I need, we need to be more. I need to be more faithful to the time, so we won't read this section. Okay, but maybe we can just fellowship about it briefly. Um, but I encourage you to read this section, uh, the par parable of the prodigal son, Luke fifteen eleven through twenty four. Okay, so we probably. If you're familiar with this part of the Bible, you know, we had a, there's a parable. There's a son who leaves the father's presence. He takes all of the father's inheritance and he spends it dissolutely, right? He wastes it all. And eventually he realizes, he comes to his senses because he's in a very bad situation. He's in a bad situation. He's hungry. Uh, he is longing to be satisfied with what the pigs are eating, what the hogs are eating. And so he's hungry. He's starving. His life is in turmoil, right? You need food to eat, okay, uh, to live, sorry, <laughs> and live, right? Uh, but then eventually he comes to his, his senses, right? And then he says, you know, oh, my father, in my father's house, there's so much bread. The servants get bread. He's, he's, he's equating himself to a servant. The servants uh, enjoy the food. And here I am, I'm dying of famine. So I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. Right? And then he, uh, he rose up and came to his father. He, he got this plan. And it says here, when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. So the father was looking for him. Right? Waiting for, when is my son returning? Day after day. Right? And then the father ran out and kissed, you know, kissed him. Uh, fell on his neck, and the son, you know, utters his prepared speech, Father, I've sinned against you, against heaven, and before you, I'm no longer worthy to call your son. And the father dismisses what he says, doesn't acknowledge what he says, actually. The father said to his slaves, bring out the best robe, put it on him, right, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet. This is actually a picture of a sinner repenting, returning to God, and receiving God's judicial redemption. All right, oh, I've sinned. I'm a sinner. That's right. You are a sinner. All right. And what's the father's response? Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Okay, the best robe is Christ as our objective righteousness. All right. The one who died for me, 
When I repent and believe, I receive Christ as my righteousness. I am justified before God. I am, I am uh, propitiated, I'm reconciled to God. I'm sanctified positionally. Okay, but is that where this parable ends? No. You know, and bring the fattened calf. Slaughter it. Let us eat and be merry. All right. If a son of mine was dead and lives again, he was lost and been found, they begin to be married. Okay, so the robe did not fulfill the need of the son. With If that's all the father did, what, why did the son go back to the father? He was hungry. He needs food. I'm dying. I need life supply. Objective righteousness does not supply me with life. I need it, absolutely, I, absolutely, I need to be justified. But the purpose of that is the food, is the organic side. So when the son arrived in his fallen condition, it was not, uh, it was not up to the father's standard. Bring up the best robe mm -hmm. first. He needs to be brought up to my standard. Mm -hmm. He needs to be ex experience my judicial redemption. Right? I need to qualify him. And so qualifying him was putting the best robe. Okay, now you're qualified to be in my presence. Now let's get some food into you. Right? <laughs> you need Christ in you. You need food. You, know, you need to grow. You need to organically. Position has changed. Hallelujah. Get in the house. You're not mm -hmm. in darkness. You're in the house now. What are they doing in the house? They're eating. Right? Oh, they're eating and drinking and being married. Right? So the position, why, why do we change position? is so that we can grow, uh, we can experience God's organic salvation, Amen. right? And so in uh, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, um, uh, maybe we all could read this uh, out loud. Amen. Okay, ready, set, go. Giving thanks to the Father, as well as the Father, and share our body of worship for the saints in the life, who delivered us out of the authority of darkness, and transferred us from the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Amen. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You qualified us. We received judicial redemption. You transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of Your love, so we can now experience Your organic salvation. Thank you, Father.